Uh, and here I was, Henry Alul was one of my teacher actually at Solid State, so I'm a bit scared of giving this talk. <laughs> 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 All right, so, um, so this is the first of four lectures on the, the two-dimensional Hubbard model. This is a school on strongly correlated system. So it's impossible not to talk about the Hubbard model, right? Because the Hubbard model is everywhere, right? Uh, I think uh, there is a famous book by Volovic saying that there is, you can find the entire universe in a helium droplet. Probably it's also true to say that you can find the entire law of the universe encoded in the, in the Hubbard model. At least that's the aim of, of, my, of my talk. Well, of course, I have just four lectures, so I cannot cover the uh, entire universe. So this is the selection that I prepare for you. So first, today, we are going to do an introduction to the Hubbard model. Then uh, we are going to study some, uh, we, are, we are hopefully getting some physical insights from simple limits. And I'll try to make connection between the Hubbard model, which is a, a fermionic model, two model of spins. So yesterday we saw with Andri uh, spin models, and next week we are going also to investigate uh, uh, spin model systems. So there is a deep connection between the Hubbard model and the Heisenberg model, for instance. Uh, and then, uh, well, I think uh, in, uh, in a summer school for PhD and postdocs, there should be a good mix between, good mixing between something that is known and something that is unknown and attempts to explore the unknown region of, uh, of a system, like the 2D Haber model. So I will discuss some phases from a technique known under the name of cluster dynamic mean field theory. Okay? Um, I will give you references during my, 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 my classes, but here I want to emphasize two main references that uh, I think will be, uh, there are, I mean, I found it very useful to prepare this, uh, uh, this lecture, and in general, uh, if you are interested in the 2D Hubbard model. The first is actually uh, 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 a, a lecture notes on many-body problem by Professor André-Marie Tremblay in, uh, at the University of Sherbrooke in Canada, where you can find uh, many chapters devoted to the Hubbard model. Uh, and then another beautiful book by Patrick Fazekas. Uh, you probably know this book, it's Lecture Notes on uh, Electron Correlation and Magnetism. So, so these are two main references, all right? And please don't hesitate to ask questions, right? So there are no stupid questions, there are just maybe stupid answers, right? <laughs> okay, it's from, from my side. Okay, so lecture one, so what is the menu for today? Uh, so first we are going to, uh, to discuss, well, what is the Hubbard model, if you want the Hubbard model 101, with no formulas. Uh, so two, we are going to discuss, well, so why should you care about the Hubbard model? So why is the Hubbard model interesting? Then we are going to discuss, we are going to be, uh, become a bit technical, so we are going to do a qualitative derivation of the Hubbard model. So how do we go from the theory of everything, which for condensing matter physics is the Schrodinger equation, to the uh, uh, Hubbard model? Well, it's not quite true. Yesterday, um, Jean-Noël said that, okay, you can also use the Dirac equation, but here we restrict ourselves to, to the Schrodinger equation, all right? And then we are going to discuss, well, what are the parameters of the Hubbard model? And then, well, this will just make a list of the phases that we want to study in this course. So I should say that this is a very controversial topic, the, the Hubbard model. So, so maybe there would be you know, a few 
huge debate about probably, hopefully, not in the first two lectures, maybe, <laughs> but definitely in the third and the fourth. Okay. Uh, if there are no such uh, discussion, it means that I fail my lecture, right? Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, okay, so let's do uh, first point. So why is the Hubbard model interesting? Uh, sorry, what is the Hubbard model? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, no, because I mean, I, I absolutely want to tell you why it's important. So, but first, <laughs> first, what is first? So, so what is the Hubbard model without formulas? Uh, well, the Hubbard model is a model of electrons in a lattice. So here I want to focus on the fermionic Hubbard model. I'm not talking about bosonic Hubbard model. Sorry, Damian, I know that you're working on, on the bosonic Hubbard model. So, and I want to restrict my attention as well on the two-dimensional system because uh, Mark, Fabrice, told me that okay, this school, there is particular emphasis on a two-dimensional system. We already discussed the Moiré superlattices with Dimitri, okay? All right, so it's a model of electrons in a lattice. So this is my lattice. Uh, uh, so basically, at each side of the lattice, you have an atomic uh, orbitals that is localized at the center of my, uh, of the, uh, of my site of the lattice. So let's consider, say, 1s orbitals. So there is room for two electrons. So each side can be empty, can be up, down, or doubly occupied, right? Um, so the Hubbard model is encoding three key uh, properties of the electrons. So the first properties is that the electrons move, right? So electrons move. Well, if we want to be a, more, a bit more technical, we have to say that how, how do ele the electron moves? Well, the atomic orbital overlaps. So and as a result, you can have quantum mechanical tunneling between the orbitals, so effectively, you can electrons can hop with a hopping amplitude t. Can you read uh, the back? Should I write bigger? So this is t is the hopping amplitude. Okay. Um, uh, so the electrons can hop from side to side with the hopping amplitude uh, t. Then the second key properties of the electrons is that the electrons are charged particles, so they interact. So the electron interact. Well, how do they interact? Via the Coulomb repulsion, right? So each time a site will be doubly occupied, you have to pay an energy cost, and let's call this energy cost U. So the energy cost associated with the Coulomb repulsion, okay? And then you saw that I put an up and down electron. This is because the third key properties of the electron is that the electrons are indistinguishable fermionic particles with spin half. So these are fermions. Electrons are fermions with spin half. Okay? All right, so these are the three essential properties. And already from, from, from this discussion, you can see that the Hubbard model arguably is the minimal model that may capture the competition or the tension between kinetic energy, so tendency of electrons to move, so to delocalize through the lattice, and potential energy, so tendency of electrons to remain localized around their nucleus. So imagine that this uh, lattice is half filled, so there is one particle per site. So you don't want to hop, because if you hop, you have to pay an energy cost associated with the Coulomb repulsion. Okay? So, so there is this competition, competition 
between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So that's why uh, 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 some people refer to this electron like hesitant electrons. Actually, this is a copyright by Antoine Georges, who is one of the inventors of the technique uh, dynamical mean field theory. So why electrons are hesitant? Well, they are hesitating between uh, being the localized wave or localized particle. So sometimes it will be better to think of electrons as particles, sometimes it will be better to think of electrons as waves. Okay? All right, so that's the main message of this, uh, of this part. Okay? All right, so now, se second point, so why this simple model is interesting? Uh, well, uh, I think, so why is the Hubbard model interesting? Well, so let's write here maybe. So, so the first reason I, can, uh, I came up with is that, at least to me, it's quite appealing that sometimes in physics you find some model that has a very rich set of solutions, and this set of solutions <coughs> can explain a very rich, complex behavior of nature, but still with minimal assumptions, right? So for me, the beauty or the interest of the Hubbard model is that you can really capture the essence of the physics encoded in some complex physical phenomena. The Hubbard model is one such example. The uh, Ising model is another one, right? So, so it's a minimal model capturing um, well the essence of complex and rich uh, behavior. Uh, well, in nature, right? Okay? Then, another reason why this is interesting uh, to me is, well, this is something I think we can say that the Hubbard model is the closest thing that we have uh, to be like the standard model for strongly correlated electron system, right? And by standard model here, I'm thinking like we have a, a framework in which we can explain or we, uh, hopefully we are, we are, we, we are trying to ex explain physical phenomena, okay? Then another reason that personally I like a lot, I found the Hubbard model is, the f is very interesting because to me, the Hubbard model is like the, uh, the easing model for many body physics, right? Many body physics. And by that, I mean that the Hubbard model over the years assume the same crucial importance uh, that the, the easing model has, for instance, to explain uh, critical phenomena in, in classical mechanics, okay? But here for many body physics. Um, then I think another reason why it's interesting, you see I wrote, I, I didn't wrote any formula, but you see this is the, I just draw a picture. So to me the Hubbard model is pretty a compact statement a compact mathematical statement of a hard problem, right? The competition between kinetic and potential energy of hard problem in physics. Statement, yes, yeah, statement, compact statement of a difficult problem in, in physics. Um, then maybe 
another reason for maybe for theorists. Uh, 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 well, ultimately, what is interesting is that what we don't understand, right? So, so the Hubbard model was introduced in 1963 by John Hubbard, and uh, we are in 2019, so it's 56 years, and uh, it's not yet fully solved. So, so it's interesting because, well, uh, it's not yet fully solved, fully solved, right? Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, but you see, I mean, since I mentioned the easing model, the easing model was introduced in the 20s, right, by uh, people, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, by uh, uh, Lens and uh, easing, right? So <coughs> easing gave the solution of the 1D model in 1924, five, four, five, and uh, to solve the 2D easy model, we had to wait until on Sager in 1944, and just with uh, zero magnetic field, right? Um, so here we can say that we live in a pre on Sager era, right? So, but it's good for you, it's a good news because, I mean, you are the future, right? So, we are close. So, 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 okay, so it's not really solved, so we live in this pre on Sagar era. Um, uh, uh, but by that, I mean, it's, there is not just an historical reason why I mentioned this, is that I mean, people were not just waiting 56 years just contemplating uh, the model. Well, they developed sophisticated many-body techniques, right? So, so the Hubbard model over the years emerged as a playground, playground to develop sophisticated many-body techniques. All right, for instance, I will discuss cluster dynamic mean field theory. For instance, um, Andre yesterday discussed uh, um, uh, DMRG, right? So that's another technique ca that can be used uh, to, uh, to solve the, uh, the Hubbard model. All right, so uh, then uh, what else did I wrote here? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, so another reason why to me this is interesting. Uh, uh, well, the beauty of condensed matter theory is that we have experiments out there, right? So we ultimately, we want to compare our prediction to, to nature, right? So, so to me, the Hubbard model is interesting because within the Hubbard model, we can ask, so you can, oh, I'm not sure I can write this. You can ask, <laughs> okay, you can ask, okay, right here. You can ask deep, deep questions about, uh, the physics Uh, well, of natural phenomena. So which kind of phenomena we are aiming to capture? So here, well, I'm, I'm supposed to be, so what are the physical phenomena that we are going to, to discuss within the Hubbard model? Well, we can discuss the electronic properties of solids with narrow bands. So like uh, D and F orbitals, by electronic properties, I mean, uh, um, say, band structure, density of state, but also thermodynamic properties, right? Um, also, we want to discuss magnetism. So this is actually the original birthplace of the Hubbard model. Hubbard was trying to understand 
magnetism in elements like iron, cobalt, nickel, okay? But more in general, within the Hubble model, we can discuss phase transition and crossover phenomena. And here, I need to mention probably the most important phase transition that you can discuss with the Hubble model, namely the MOT metal insulator transition. So it's a metal to insulator transition due to the electronic correlation. We are going to discuss this in, in length. Then, well, you can also discuss, uh, uh, well, uh, Pierce already, well, there is an entire set of lecture on superconductivity, so the Hubbard model can be used to discuss uh, unconventional superconductivity, okay? Uh, then, I think it's, it's pretty important to say that the Hubbard model uh, is believed to capture the qualitative physics of the cuprates, the high temperature uh, superconductors, so, so cuprates. And I hope that by the end of my lectures, you will, it will be clear my opinion on, on this point. Uh, well, the answer to me is yes, but okay, this, uh, okay, well, we'll you will see. Uh, um, uh, and then, uh, yep, uh, then the other thing is that, well, uh, in the last 20 years, the Hubbard model is used also in the context of cold atoms loaded in optical lattices, right? Cold atoms in optical lattices. And then we also saw this week that uh, the Hubbard model can be also used to try to understand the Moiré super lattices, right? Maybe, okay. Okay? Okay, yeah, so that's, uh, 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 that's to me why everyone should be excited to study the Hubbard model, okay? But why do we need the Hubbard model? So, do you have some ideas? Well, during your undergraduate studies, I, I'm pretty sure, I think you came across the Ashcroft Mermi, for instance, book. But there, you see there is the band theory, right? So the Hubbard model is the minimal model that goes beyond band theory. So why we need the Hubbard model is that we need to go beyond band theory to try to explain the correlated physics encoded in uh, quantum materials, right? So correlated quantum materials, okay? So why we need the Hubbard model is that we want to go beyond, beyond band theory. So this means that, I'm, I'm always telling to my students, right? Uh, we have the ashcroft mermin to non-correlated system. This means that you have the chance to write a new book. I mean, a new, uh, not just a book, right? I mean, you have the chance to, uh, to write a new physics, right? A physics of strongly correlated system, okay? This, we still need it, right? We still need it, a, a, a coherent theory to describe this system, okay? All right. Okay, so, all right, so uh, I think I covered more or less what I wanted to, to say. Uh, uh, and any doubts, question up to here? Okay, so now let's try to discuss how one can, yeah? Question made by Juliet. Yeah, yeah. Was Hubbard model actually invented by Hubbard or by Sir Anderson? Oh, okay, so now you are putting me in trouble. Okay, so, well, 
my, my standard answer to here is that when people are starting discussing with the paternity of something, it means that the thing is really good, right? Mm -hmm. So because actually everybody wants to do it, to be the father or the mother of, of this mother, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, you are right, and then there were historically there were many people that, uh, 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 so there was Hubbard, Kanamori, uh, Anderson, uh, yes, uh, it, it, it was in the air, mm. but still you need geniuses like Hubbard, Anderson, then yes, yes, okay, thank you, thank you very much for, for, the <laughs> for, 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 for this <laughs> historical digression. Um, but this also allows me to introduce the next topic, so the next topic is the qualitative derivation of the Hubbard model. Here, I'm going to follow actually the, the original um, uh, articles by Hubbard. So Hubbard, in the 1963 and 64, wrote a series of three articles in the uh, proceeding of the Royal Society in London. So in 1963, so my derivation follows the, the derivation of John Hubbard then uh, I really recommend actually to, to read these papers because they are really beautiful. And then if you go there, you will not see the Hubbard U, but you will see the Hubbard I. Yes, am, am I right, Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, all right, so, okay, so, all right, so let's do this derivation. So this, we are going to be a bit technical here. Uh, uh, um, so my main goal is that I want to show you that the Hubbard model is an effective model for interacting electrons in solids. So here I gave you, if you want, a phenomenological introduction to the model, but how do we, do we go to this, this model from starting from the Schrodinger equation? So the idea is that from Schrodinger equation to the Hubbard model, okay? So how do we do that? Well, we follow four steps. Well, I will do some derivation, but you have to fill the dots, right? Because sometimes the derivation are a bit long, but uh, I'm here an entire two weeks, so I'm happy to help everyone in the derivation. So the first step is that, well, we want to write the electronic Hamiltonian of, a si of our system. Then we are going to write down this electronic Hamiltonian within the second quantization. So here we are going to use the, um, the field operators that uh, Pierce introduced yesterday, right? Field operators. So if you are not familiar with second quantization, uh, mm -hmm. well, we can discuss it later. I mean, I can also give you a tutorial if you want uh, during these two weeks. So third, uh, well, once we do that, well, we want to commit ourselves to a very interesting basis set, so the Vanier, Vanier representation. And then up to here, it's more or less exact. But then here we are introducing the Hubbard approximation. So here we retain only, so here we are going to make the approximation. So we, take, we retain only the dominant term. term and we discard all the rest, okay? So that's what we have to do now. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so I don't really want to start from the very beginning, so, so, um, so I just want to write down the electronic Hamiltonian. So this means that I'm using the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, right? So I'm considering the ion fixed. Okay. 
So, uh, so in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, Born-Oppenheimer approximation, so my electronic, so basically we consider the motion of the electrons, if you want, in a rigid lattice. Uh, so the electronic part of my, of my Hamiltonian, H electronic, consists of three terms, right? The first term, one to n, ah. So this is a vector, well, I should write a vector, square plus, let me write down first the terms. Well, okay, so let's write all the terms. Well, four pi. Okay. So it consists of three terms. So the first term is the kinetic energy. Well, okay, so what is this? So h bar, the m is the mass of the electrons, the sum is running over all our electrons, and this uh, is just, well, uh, well, in one dimension, it's just second derivative. Right? Okay, so voila, so that's our kinetic energy of the electrons. The second term is the electron-ion interaction. So how can I write this term? V electron ion interaction. Well, it's something like sum over alpha from one to n. V R I minus R alpha. Capital R alpha are the position of the ions. And if you want really to write uh, in full, well, Z, the atomic uh, number divided R i minus R a. Hopefully I've not done any mistake. Uh, so that's the, uh, the interaction between the electron and the ions. Uh, okay, well, okay, so uh, uh, if, yeah, you can put everything more generic, but yes, so it's so let me write like this, so I can change this. Yeah, okay, if you want, yes. Okay, so, but the important part is that, okay, these two terms form the one body part, because you see that they depend only on one coordinate. So these two form, so how can I write this? Uh, how can I write this? H naught, sum high, one to n, well, these two parts, right, minus two m ri plus v ri, and uh, what did I miss? Yeah, so I want to write in this in this way, h naught. So it's one body term. Well, there is one body term plus there is a two body term which is our Coulomb repulsion between electrons at the position i and j, okay? So that's the Coulomb, uh, the, uh, the Coulomb repulsion between electrons at position i and j. Uh, um, 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 uh, well, here maybe a technical remark, so it doesn't really matter the form of the one-body term, so all what I'm saying the following is generic, so, so, so the Hamiltonian consists of two parts, H naught plus H interaction. Okay? So, fine with the first step, Second step, we need to quantize, so to do a second quantization of this, uh, of this Hamiltonian. So, um, so 
Uh, so we need to use a suitable basis. Uh, uh, so, so we are going to use so second quantization. So why second? You know, well, just the thing to remember is that in first quantization you go from uh, particles, right, to waves. Here, in second quantization, we are going from waves, well, actually field operators, to particles, which are nothing but excitation of our field operators. Okay, so here we are using, uh, I said, we have to commit to a representation, so we are going to use the real space representation, or if you want, position representation. So this means that we are going to use the same field operator that Pierce introduced yesterday. So we have our Psi Sigma R and Psi Daga Sigma R. So this is the creation and, this and the annihilation operator. So this operator creates an, an, an electron with spin sigma at the position R. Similarly, this operator destroys an electron with spin sigma at position R. Now, these operators are defined at every position in space, right, R. That's why they're called field operators, okay? So, so these are quantum field operators. Quantum field operators. And they obey some uh, anti-commutation rules because we are dealing with fermions, so this means that, I don't know, we have psi sigma of R, psi sigma of R, uh, yeah, this is zero, so we have psi daga sigma of R, psi daga sigma of R. Well, this symbol means that is an anti-commutation, right? So it's zero, and then the other one is Psi sigma of R, ah, <laughs> Psi sigma of R, say R prime, say, so, dagger. So this is delta sigma sigma prime, delta R, R prime. So, so with that, uh, I think I need to skip a few, few lines of the calculation. Uh, well, actually, if you want, to well, I actually, I think I, since I put R prime here, yeah, uh, doesn't really matter, okay. Okay, so now we want to rewrite this Hamiltonian with this di within these objects. Well, here I'm skipping a few steps, but this is standard calculation you can find in any uh, textbook of many body physics. For instance, yesterday you saw, for instance, in the in the in the book of Pierce, right? There is a discussion how to write one body term or two body term. So if I do that, well our H naught, the one body term, is written in this way, si sum over sigma integral dr, psi sigma of r, uh, a big parenthesis, psi sigma of r. And here in the middle, I just have to write down this thing, right? So I have to write down minus 2m plus v of r, okay? Oh, and I've done a, a critical mistake. There is a dagger missing. So you see, when you write in second quantization, I mean, the derivation is long, but the result to keep in mind is very easy. It really looks like the average that you do in standard particle, uh, in standard quantum mechanics with the wave function of one particle wave function, right? The difference is that you don't have any more wave function, but you have field operators. And these field operators, psi and psi daga, and these field operators do not commute. That's the difference. So similarly, H interacting, well, it's uh, the same thing, one half sigma sigma prime integral dr dr prime well here I have my coulomb c coulomb r minus r prime 
And then I have to write my operators, psi, sigma, r, psi, sigma, prime, daga, r prime, oh no, um, I, I, I need, need, need this. Uh, okay, I'm here, psi, sigma, prime, r prime, psi, sigma of r, uh, yes, so what is my VC? Well, VC is the Coulomb. So is E square, well, I forgot the constant, one over pi, uh, so R minus R prime. So and again, this is very similar to an average of quantum mechanics, mm, single particle quantum mechanics. The difference again is that we have field operators. And the other crucial importance is that the order actually matter. R, R prime, R prime, R, sigma, sigma prime, sigma prime, sigma. Okay? So I skip completely the, the proof of all this, of this part. Um, um, and instead, I will go directly to our, so we did this, second quantization, Vanier presentation. So all this is very nice, but now we want to write a, a simple representation of this Hamiltonian. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, uh, the first thing that we are going to do is that we are going to expand our field operators in terms of block states. And then the second step, we are using the Vanier representation which can be expressed in terms of block states, okay? And that will motivate why we are going to use the Vanier, the Vanier basis. Okay, so let's expand. So third point, okay. So we expand our Psi dagger. Well, I, I drop just for, for simplicity the sigma. So this is just sigma of some, sorry, sum over K of C, K daga, K R. Well, so if you want to, to write uh, in full, sum over K, C K daga. Uh, well, I don't know, E minus I K R. And I'm pretty sure there is some factor here, maybe the volume uh, of the brilliant zone. Um, so Psi R, well, it's the same thing, sum over K. CK, well, okay, so let's write, uh, so my way to memorize thing, R, K, and CK, where our CK and CK dagger are called block operator, block operators. Well, okay, and again, the block operators obey similar anti-commutation rules, right? Should I write down or no? Let's uh, maybe just write down just one. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, case space, yes. So, so this is, well, I don't know, if it be C, K, C, K, dagger, it will be just delta K, K prime, right? And the other are zero. Okay, so. Now, the, the trouble is that, okay, you see, ultimately, we want to discuss, so imagine that these are our, our positions, right, i, j, so these are our orbitals. We want to describe localized orbitals. But the block states are completely delocalized in space. <coughs> so we need to find something better. So, and the something better is the Vanier basis. So, so Vanier, well, Vanier was, uh, uh, I think, uh, a Swiss uh, researcher in physics. Uh, but, um, but this, I, I, I don't know more than that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay, so, uh, 
So Vanier, Vanier basis, say, why we want to use the Barnier basis? Because the Vanier basis, contrary to the block basis, the Vanier basis is, the Vanier function are localized around the atomic positions. So that's why we want to use it. So how do I, they are defined in this way? W R minus R I, that's the definition. Well, they are nothing but the Fourier transform, actually, of the block function. So one over, over n, sum over k, e minus i k r i, phi k of r. So this is our uh, block function, right? Okay? So n is the number of lattices, uh, side of the lattice. So, well, the Bernier function, for, for those of you who has a mathematical appetite, uh, they are very interesting because they form a complete or orthonormal set. So they obey the some orthonormality and completeness relation. So the integral of R dr, R minus R i, omega R minus R j, delta i j, so this is our orthonormality. T relation, and then the completeness relation. Yes, okay, so that's correct. So completeness relation, sum over i, r prime minus r i, minus, well, r minus r i, prime, eh? Prime. So this is our delta r minus r prime. So is our complete, well, I think, I don't know, completeness or closure relation, depending on your literature. So why I'm putting these two? Because I want, I am, I'm asking you as an exercise then to do the derivation and you have to use this property, okay? So uh, uh, another mathematical and physical remark is that the Vanier bases actually are not uniquely defined. Actually, you can, you can uh, they, they are defined up to a phase factor. And this led, for instance, uh, Vanderbilt to suggest the, a way to, to create maximally localized wave function. But I, I don't want to enter into such detail, okay? Um, all right, so, uh, so now why I've done this? Because I want to rewrite my field operators in terms uh, of the block uh, uh, states. Uh, sorry, in terms of the um, vanier. So if I do that, so I'll just give you the final result here. If I do that, I need to start from uh, these two. Uh, Oh, well, okay, so let's, okay, so, okay, let's, let's do the int intermediate step. So let's uh, write, uh, well, okay, so let's write our, okay, so, okay, so let, let's write this step. Psi sigma of R, our field operators, are written in terms of the Vanier basis in this way, sum over I, R minus R I, C R I, and Psi Sigma R is sum of R I, Omega star R minus R I, C R I, whoops, uh, there is a dagger, there is a dagger, and then if I take the Fourier transform of this, that's the thing that I need, I want to extract this thing, right? Uh, let me rewrite, so okay, CRI, now from now on I will call it CI. It's just the Fourier transform of this, so it's the integral over dr, r minus ri, psi sigma of r, and our C 
ti i sigma well look i sigma also is oh dr omega star r minus r i psi sigma of r so now we have completed our stuff because every time now i'm gonna ask you this exercise so every th so ooh, write this hamiltonian so you just have to substitute psi and psi dagger every time you see psi psi dagger you use this relation and you express the hamiltonian in terms of ci and ci dagger so if you do that our h not it can be written in this way some okay perfect okay so i'm over sigma i j psi r i well i don't know it will be our kinetic plus the local part psi r j and then i will have our c r dagger sigma c j sigma <coughs> yes and then h interacting it will be half sum of our sigma sigma prime sum of i j k l well here ow uh, i need more space because i need to write four right four of them so i will have our psi can i write just i uh, psi j then i will have our v coulomb then i will have psi k psi l and then i have the operators so i will have c i sigma dagger c j sigma prime dagger then i have to pay attention c l sigma prime c k sigma sigma that's it so i j k l i j l k daga daga and uh, destruction destruction correct uh, okay so now i want to rewrite this matrix element in a more compact way so i want to rewrite this thing like this i i h not j so this will be nothing but our hopping amplitude t i j okay yeah and what about this well if you work out the math well there are a few lines of math i'm not going to do that sorry so that's the end of pedagogical uh, teaching right when professors say you can show that mm. so especially mm, when professors say few lines maybe i'm skipping two pages <laughs> so but okay so anyway so now i want to rewrite the second matrix element right second matrix element uh, in a compact way i will write oh let me change color so i will have i j our v coulomb k l so this will be uh, well this will be i will call it u i j k l that's our matrix element that depends on four indices okay so this is nothing but an integral right would you like that right okay I, I can write this just to give you an idea so what is this if you do the math 
So if you do the maths of this, this will be nothing but the integral over dr, omega star r minus ri. Then you will have the kinetics plus potential, the, sorry, the kinetic plus the local part, plus v local. And then I will have my omega r minus r j, ij ij. So if you want, that's a convolution of two uh, Vanier function at the position i and j. And this will be the overlap between this function. Okay? Okay, so now we need still to do, so we did, we did, we did, we need to do this, the point number four. So up to here, everything is exact. Well, uh, apart from the, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, everything can be uh, as exact. Um, so, so now we are going to introduce the approximation. So the approximation are the following. Now consider, so I, I, I was telling you that the, 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 the Vanier function are localized around the atomic positions, okay? So it means that they do not overlap a lot, okay? So this means that, uh, say four, in so what are the approximation? Approximation, well in our H naught, the bold approximation that we are going to make is that we restrict the hopping only between nearest neighbor, okay? So we neglect the long range hopping. So basically, we just consider the Tij equal to T if we have nearest neighbor and zero otherwise, okay? Then we are going to check all these approximations, so, so don't worry. So in H1, in H1, well, so what is in H1? So we have a matrix elements, I, J, K, L. The approximation that we are going to make is that we restrict ourselves to I equal to J equal to K equal to L. So basically, we are going to have just u, i, 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 right? Okay? So let's call this u over two. So what is this? Well, so let's again, it will be an integral similar to this one. So if we do that, we are going to find something like this, integral over dr, dr prime, omega r minus r prime. Oh, sorry, I call it um, v coulomb, v coulomb. So that's my v coulomb, v coulomb. And then I have my four um, Vanier functions, right? So here I have two because I'm in the, uh, in the uh, non-interacting part. In the interacting, I have four functions, right? So here, I will have just the modulus square of the Vanier at r minus ri and Vanier r minus rj. Uh, sorry, what, what was I saying? Uh, i, 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 so i. <laughs> so i everywhere, okay? So, so, so this is the modulus square, if you want the probability. Huh? Sorry, I, I. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. So, thanks, thanks a lot. Okay, so, okay, let's try to do that. So now, let's try to write our H interaction. Uh, H interaction will be some sigma sigma prime, U, I, 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 I. And then I have, uh, well, all these terms, right? The operators, 
So I will have ci sigma ci oh, ci sigma prime ci sigma prime ci sigma. Then, well, you do some anti-commutations. Can I skip this little calculation? So basically, I'm going to find ui is u over two. Uh, going to find u sum over i and i up and i down. Where n i sigma is the number operator i Um, oh, well, no, there is no sum over i. Uh, uh, okay, so that's our term. This is the number operator, so it tells me that at the site i, I will have an electron with spin up and an electron with spin down. Okay? Um, Very good, so that's actually, no, no, it's not, no, well, it's a very good question. Um, so I'm saying that we are, that's a bold approximation. So we are neglecting all the rest. Now, if you go back to the paper of Hubbard, actually he's made, he's, he, in the paper he made some estimates about the missing terms. And I want to discuss a few of these missing terms. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I will do it at the end. Can I do it? I will restrict everything to one band, and I'll show you how to generalize to, to multi-band. Um, okay, so the question is, we restrict it to this, but uh, we have many other combination, right? So what are we going to neglect? So, um, so here, I have to skip a few things, but so let's try to see. I will discuss just few terms that are missing in this approximation. So, okay, so for instance, we are neglecting terms like, we are neglecting like terms like i equal to k, j equal to l. Sometimes these in literature are called direct terms. So you can see this like this, right? You have i, j, and then you go back to i, you go back to j. So, so this will be u, i, j, i, j. Uh, and then if you do uh, the algebra, well, you will find something like this, dr, dr prime, V Coulomb, R minus R prime, the modulus square of R minus R i, j. So, and le let, me, let me write down this uh, uh, h int, the interacting term, in this case will be something like this, some sigma sigma prime, sigma i different from j, and we'll have v i j n i sigma and j sigma. So here you see that we have the square moduli of the vanier at site i and site j. So physically, this may lead to instability like char density wave, right? Because you have occupation at i and occupation at j. Okay, so that's the uh, kind of thing that we neglect. But then we also neglect other terms that sometimes are, are called ex uh, exchange term. Yes, ex exchange, exchange term, exchange term. So, and I just want to briefly mention this because it's important from a physical point of view. So exchange terms. So basically, if you want in graph, you have i, you have your j, then okay, well you have like this, right? So 
you will have our i and you will have our j. So that's why it's exchange. And then you will have your u, i, j, j, i. Oh, well, I, d I will not write all this thing. I'll just write like i, j, f, and I will explain why f in a second. And uh, h interacting, it will be with few manipulation, it will be equal to minus half, but you saw two days ago with uh, Andri this same equation, so you didn't complain two days ago, so you shouldn't complain with me. So, so j i j f, uh, uh, sigma i, sigma j, plus n i and j, where sigma are Pauli matrices, so they're spin if you want, well, I don't know, S i is h bar over 2 sigma i, right? So, so the important thing is that jf is positive. So this is a ferromagnetic coupling. And this you say, wow, that's a wow moment, right? Because you saw that we started just from Coulomb repulsion. And we see that encoded in the Coulomb repulsion, there are some instabilities, secondary instabilities that are emerging, like these charge instabilities of these magnetic instabilities. Okay? And that's very important. Okay, well, we neglect this part, but we are going to see that there will be some anti-ferromagnetic instability. But the, the idea is the same. We start from the, just the Coulomb, right? the Coulomb repulsion, and then there are some emerging phenomena that are happening, okay? That's, uh, that's important. Um, how do I see that is ferromagnetic coupling just, uh, just with the hands without doing any maths? Well, consider just two sides, uh, just two sides, I and J. Well, uh, well, you want to minimize the Coulomb repulsion. So let me write down the wave function envelope for the two for the two electrons, if I want to minimize the the, the Coulomb interaction, I need an um, uh, um, how's it called anti-symmetric wave function. So I'll try to do something like this, something like this, right? But then the total wave function must be anti-symmetric, so I need spin up, right? So whereas if I add I don't know, if I have spin up and down, well, the wave function must be symmetric, and then you see that there is a non-zero probability of finding the, the electron in between, right? So you don't want that. But that's nothing but the Hund's rule in atomic physics, right? Okay? So that's very important. To me, the key part of this thing is that both here and here, we found something important. The key message is that the from electrostatic interaction, you get some effective coupling. Here is a magnetic coupling, right? So say magnetic coupling, I think. Magnetic coupling. That's important. Okay? So now you see we discard all this term, and we consider just this. Now, in the paper of Hubbard, actually was made, Hubbard made some estimates of this term, and he, he was actually was using 3s orbitals instead of d orbitals. Um, but he found that, okay, this part in general is dominant, but uh, in different situations, this part can be important as well, okay? So we are doing an approximation. So with this approximation, well, I cannot, I mean, I need to write down the Hubbard model, right? At least in the lecture number one. So we should do that, right? So we did all the job. So we just have to, to collect the, the part that we, we, uh, we haven't uh, uh, we, we considered. So the Hubbard model will consist of two terms, H0 plus H int. H0 is just this T, right? And the T carries a C C dagger. So there will be 
minus t sum i j t sorry c i sigma c j sigma well okay so the sum also on sigma plus u sum over i n i up n i down that's the Hubbard model. Well, okay, if you work in the grand canonical ensemble, well, you have h minus mu n, so this will be the same thing, minus mu sum over i and sigma, n, uh, sorry, the, the n operator, yes, yeah, so n i sigma. So, and uh, we, we are going to use the grand canonical ensemble a lot. Um, Okay, so that's the Hubbard model, and now you can understand the drawing that I was putting at the beginning, right? So let's connect the dots. There is a hopping amplitude between site i and j, t, i, j, but we neglected, give me another color, we neglected this, right, the second, near, the second neighbor hopping, we neglect all these things. And then when two electrons occupy the same site, you have to pay an energy cost associated with a Coulomb repulsion, U, okay? That's the two terms that are encoded in the Hamiltonian. And okay, due to the Pauli principle, you can only have up and down, okay? Good, so, so now, we did this, we did this. A like checklist uh, is reassuring, right, in general. So, so now, what are the parameters of the model? The parameters of the model, well, okay, so we just have to look at the, of this Hamiltonian. There are some obvious parameters. That the first parameter is the hopping, right, T. So what are the parameters of the model? For we have the hopping amplitude. And then the only thing that, uh, well, okay, so let's do this. T, we have the on-site repulsion, on-site Coulomb repulsion. But then the only thing that matters is actually the ratio between U and T. So from now on, I will consider just t equal to one, and then actually, so this will be just the ratio between u and t. Now, u and t have the units of, they are energies, right? So the energy, okay? So they have both unit of energy, so this is unitless, okay? Then there are less obvious parameters, well, I told you, right, that the Hubbard model is a model of electrons in a lattice. So I have to specify the dimension of the lattice, right? I call it D, can be one dimension, two dimension, infinite dimension, okay? And infinite dimension, uh, it's proper mathematical limit that we are going to discuss uh, in lecture number three. Um, um, but you know, as a physicist, I mean, three-dimensional lattice, maybe with some huge coordination, three dimension is pretty close to infinity for a theory. <laughs> so we are, s we are safe. But two, no. Two and one are very different. <laughs> okay, but then, okay, there are dimension, and then I have to specify the structure of the lattice. So dimension and the structure of the lattice. So this means that I can have, say in 2D, I can have a square lattice, I can have a triangular lattice, I can, I can have more exotic lattices, right? Okay? So, so, so say square lattice, uh, triangular, etc. 
Um, then what else? Well, we have again the chemical potential. Chemical potential is actually very important. Wha what is the chemical potential? Well, the chemical potential you see is coupled to N, to the occupation. So by changing the chemical potential, you may change the occupation. So, and uh, let's write down my convention, Ni, the occupation, occupation of what? Occupation of a site. And we said that the site can be empty, up, down, or W occupied. So my convention is that N is running from zero to two. Zero means empty, two means W occupied. Okay, so voila. Uh, uh, well, because I'm considering just a 1s orbital, okay? Then mu, so t, well, u over t, the dimension, the structure, mu. Then there is a less obvious parameter. Yeah, I heard, I heard. Temperature. Wh where is temperature in my model? In the Hamiltonian? How do I get the temperature? So T over T is the temperature, right, over little t, everything can write like this, so temperature. Well, because in general, I want to calculate some observable, right? So that's the temperature emerges from thermal average, right? So imagine that, I don't know, I, I want to write, I don't know, thermal average of an operator is one over Z trace over A E minus beta H, right? Something like that. Temperature? So these are the model, are the model parameters of a one-band Hubbard model. So this is single band, so one-band Hubbard model. Okay, so now I, I want to do two things. The first thing that I want to do is that Okay, this is very well. How about the beauty of the Hubbard model is that we can modify it. So we can add parameters, we can modify the model to, to, to try to take account all the phenomena in nature. So, so how can we do that? Well, we can consider model variance. Variance well, just for the sake of simplicity, I still consider variance of the one-band Hubbard model. What can I do? The thing that I can do is that modify. How can I modify? Well, let's consider next nearest neighbor hopping, for instance, okay? So T beyond nearest neighbor. I can do this. I can also simplify the Hubbard model. Maybe less obvious. Maybe some of you knows the falikov kimball model. So if you simplify the Hubbard model, you may go to the falikov falikov kimball model. The idea is simply that, say, you put one species, say t down equal to zero, the hopping of a one species to zero, and the other one is the, the same. So sometimes this is used. The other thing that you can do, you can extend it. Modify, simplify, extend. How can I extend it? Well, I can add extra term. For instance, I can add the VIJ. So I can add the interaction, so a ne nearest neighbor interaction, right? N, I, N, J. But also I can go, so variance, so model, also, so I, say, say, I can say beyond Hubbard, the one band Hubbard model, one band. Well, what I can do, I can do multi band, multi band Hubbard model. So instead of one band, I, I generate more, 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 more bands. I can also change a few things, I can introduce something that is called the hybridization between orbitals that is important for some materials. So this uh, can lead to the description of the periodic, periodic Anderson model. 
which is used especially in the context of heavy fermion system, together with the, with the condo lattice. But also, I say, I can modify to consider the Emery model, which sometimes is used in the context of the cuprates. Okay? Um, so that's the thing that I can do. But the next thing that I want to ask you is something related more to uh, ma real materials. We have done all this job from the Schrodinger equation to this simple, beautiful model, easy to write, difficult to solve. Uh, but what is the experimental relevance of the one-band Haber model? Do you know a single material which has just a one band crossing the Fermi level? They are very rare, actually. Actually, to my knowledge, people may correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the only, they are the cuprates, the only class of system that have uh, one single. Are these? They are, yeah, they are, yeah I, was, I was planning to, to say, okay, then, yeah, okay. So they are very rare. One such exa one e example is the cuprates, the other may alkali metals. Then, if you consider molecular orbitals, there can be also the. Uh, organic, some organic compounds, maybe. Uh, uh, but, okay, so they are very rare. So, uh, so, so we have done all this job for nothing, just to describe just one class of system? No, because, you see, you can modify, right? You can modify the, 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 the model to capture uh, many other systems, multiband system, okay? But, as we said, sometimes it's better to walk before running. So let's try to understand the one band, and then we are going to change the parameters to try to understand the physics. Okay? Uh, but still, the Hubbard model remains as a good framework to think about the physics of this complicated system. Okay? Um, but then, okay, not just that. Okay, so experimental relevance. Um, so we say very rare, very rare, but, but important. Well, cuprates are still an open, crucial problem in, in condensed matter physics, okay? So, but very important, so still, still the Hubbard model is a useful framework. Okay? And then I want to say, well, in cold atoms, actually, you can really realize the one band Haber model. So that's an example where we can really test the physics. Okay? Um, um, and then I want to end by saying, over the years, actually, some scientists say, okay, maybe we don't know the, these materials, but can we do a material design? Can we create a material? that is a correlated one band. And here, I just say, just, I just also want to put some, the, if I can, if I have the possibility to put uh, this discussion in the context of recent literature. So, for instance, can we do a Huber, single band Huber model by material design? So, for instance, I uh, hope I find, I, sorry, I, I, I wrote a reference so somewhere. Uh, I, I, I need it. Where is it? Where is it? Um, so, where is my reference? Here. Yep, here. So, there is actually a beautiful paper by the group of, of uh, Nicola Spalding in Zurich. So, the first author is Griffin and uh, Spalding, Nicola Spalding, uh, is a PRB of 2016 where they did some material design, they end up with this candidate system, which is lithium, copper, fluorine. How, and they, they study uh, with DFT, 
unfortunately, the system is not uh, thermodynamically stable. But more recent, but that still is important, right? Can, can I just, just, but then more recently, actually a few months ago, two months ago, I guess, there is a beautiful paper by, uh, well, I just write the, the authors, is Isaac and Wolverton. Um, is a PRX of 2019, where they did another approach, which is called uh, material informatics. Informatics, they went through five, five more than 500,000 real and hypothetical materials, and they were checking, they were asking the code to say, can you give me a correlated one band out of this set, 14 candidates. 14 candidates, well, read it. So this is a nice paper of 2019, is material uh, informatics, who knows? Maybe now it's up to you or uh, some group to try to see if this material can be synthesized. Um, um, so, and then I, I'll conclude uh, by saying simply that uh, um, uh, so just so, so that I do what I promise. So this is just a select. What phases are we going to study? Here we are going to study the Hubbard model allow us to study metals, allow us to study band insulator, maybe it's not probably needed, uh, band insulator. We can study MOT insulators. We are going to define MOT insulators. We are going to study a uh, very debated thing is the pseudo gap gap phase and already by saying phase it's re I'm already in trouble uh, <laughs> uh, although I believe it's a phase uh, and then we study we are going to study antiferromagnetism and then we are going to study also unconventional superconductivity within the context of the Hubbard model so we are going to see especially that these two things are very related to the other lectures in this uh, in this course Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think that I moved because we have 500 hydrogen. It's one, so it's one. Okay. Solid hydrogen. Oh, solid hydrogen. Yes. yes.